Vladimir Nabokov, An Affair of Honor. The accursed day when Anton Petrovich made the acquaintance of Berg existed only in theory, for his memory had not affixed to it a date label at the time, and now it was impossible to identify that day. Broadly speaking, it happened last winter, around Christmas 1926. Berg arose out of his non-being, bowed in greeting, and settled down again into an armchair instead of his previous non-being. It was at the Kordumovs who lived on St. Markstrasse, way off in the sticks, in the Moabit section of Berlin, I believe. The Kordumovs remained the paupers they had become after the revolution, while Anton Petrovich and Berg, although also expatriates, had since grown somewhat richer. Now, when a dozen similar ties of a smoky luminous shade, say that of a sunset cloud, appeared in a haberdasher's window, together with a dozen handkerchiefs in exactly the same tints, Anton Petrovich would buy both the fashionable tie and fashionable handkerchief, and every morning on his way to the bank would have the pleasure of encountering the same tie and the same handkerchief worn by two or three gentlemen who were also hurrying to their offices. At one time he had business relations with Berg. Berg was indispensable, would call up to five times a day, began frequenting their house, and would crack endless jokes. God, how he loved to crack jokes. The first time he came, Tanya, Anton Petrovich's wife, found that he resembled an Englishman and was very amusing. Hello, Anton, Berg would roar, swooping in on Anton's hand with outspread fingers, the way the Russians do, and then shaking it vigorously. Berg was broad-shouldered, well-built, clean-shaven, and likened himself to an athletic angel. He once showed Anton Petrovich a little old black notebook. The pages were all covered with crosses, exactly 523 in number. Civil war in the Crimea, a souvenir, said Berg with a slight smile, and coolly added, Of course, <laughs> I counted only those reds I killed outright. The fact that Berg was an ex-cavalryman and had fought under General Denikin aroused Anton Petrovich's envy, and he hated when Berg would tell in front of Tanya of reconnaissance forays and midnight attacks. Anton Petrovich himself was short-legged, rather plump, and wore a monocle, which, in its free time, when not screwed into his eye socket, dangled on a narrow black ribbon, and when Anton Petrovich sprawled in an easy chair, would gleam like a foolish eye on his belly. A boil, excised two years before, had left a scar on his left cheek. This scar, as well as his coarse, cropped mustache and fat Russian nose, would twitch tensely when Anton Petrovich screwed on the monocle home. Stop making faces, Berg would say. <laughs> you won't find an uglier one. In their glasses, a light vapor floated over the tea. A half-squashed chocolate eclair on a plate released its creamy inside. Tanya, her bare elbows resting on the table, and her chin leaning on her interlaced fingers, gazed upon at the drifting smoke of her cigarette, and Berg was trying to convince her that she must wear her hair short, that all women from time immemorial had done so, that the Venus de Milo had short hair, while Anton Petrovich heatedly and circumstantially objected, and Tanya only shrugged her shoulder, knocking the ash off her cigarette with a tap of her nail. And then it all came to an end. One Wednesday at the end of July, Anton Petrovich left her castle on business, and from there sent his wife a telegram that he would return on Friday. On Friday, he found that he had to remain at least another week, and sent another telegram. On the following day, however, the deal fell through, and without bothering to wire a third time, Anton Petrovich headed back to Berlin. He arrived about ten, tired and dissatisfied with his trip. From the streets, he saw that the bedroom windows of his flat were aglow, conveying the soothing news that his wife was home. He went up to the fifth floor with three twirls of the key, unlocked the thrice-locked door, and entered. As he passed through the front hall, he heard the steady noise of running water from the bathroom. P. 
pink and moist, Anton Petrovich thought with fond anticipation and carried his bag on into the bedroom. In the bedroom, Berg was standing before the wardrobe mirror, putting on his tie. Anton Petrovich mechanically lowered his little suitcase to the floor, without taking his eyes off Berg, who tilted up his impassive face, flipped back a bright length of tie, and passed it through the knot. Above all, don't get excited, said Berg, carefully tightening the knot. Please, don't get excited. Stay perfectly calm. Must do something, Anton Petrovich thought. But what? He felt a tremor in his legs, an absence of legs, only that cold, aching terror. Do something, quick. He started pulling a glove off of one hand. The glove was new and fit snugly. Anton Petrovich kept jerking his hand and muttering mechanically, Go away, immediately. This is dreadful. Go away. I'm going, I'm going, Anton, said Berg, squaring his broad shoulders as he leisurely got into his jacket. If I hit him, he'll hit me too, Anton Petrovich thought in a flash. He pulled off the glove with a final yank and threw it awkwardly at Berg. The glove slapped against the wall and dropped into the washstand pitcher. Good shot, said Berg. He took his hat and cane and headed past Anton Petrovich towards the door. All the same, <laughs> you'll have to let me out, he said. The downstairs door is locked. Scarcely aware of what he was doing, Anton Petrovich followed him out. As they started to go down the stairs, Berg, who was in front, suddenly began to laugh. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> he said without turning his head. <laughs> but this is awfully funny, being kicked out <laughs> with such complications. At the next landing, he chuckled again and accelerated his step. Anton Petrovich also quickened his pace. That dreadful rush was unseemly. Berg was deliberately making him go down in leaps and bounds. What torture. Third floor. Second. When will these stairs end? Berg flew down the remaining steps and stood waiting for Anton Petrovich, lightly tapping the floor with his cane. Anton Petrovich was breathing heavily and had trouble getting the dancing key into the trembling lock. At last, it opened. Try not to hate me, said Berg from the sidewalk. Put yourself in my place. Anton Petrovich slammed the door. From the very beginning, he had a ripping urge to slam some door or other. The noise made his ears ring. Only now, as he climbed the stairs, did he realize that his face was wet with tears. As he passed through the front hall, he heard again the noise of running water. Hopefully waiting for the tepid to grow hot. But now, above that noise, he could also hear Tanya's voice. She was singing loudly in the bathroom. With an odd sense of relief, Anton Petrovich returned to the bedroom. He now saw what he had not noticed before, that both beds were tumbled and that a pink nightgown lay on his wife's. Her new evening dress and a pair of silk stockings were laid out on the sofa. Evidently, she was getting ready to go dancing with Berg. Anton Petrovich took his expensive fountain pen out of his breast pocket. I cannot bear to see you. I cannot trust myself if I see you. He wrote standing up, bending awkwardly over the dressing table. His monocle was blurred by a large tear. The letter swam. Please, go away. I am leaving you some cash. I will talk it over with Natasha tomorrow. Sleep at her house or at a hotel tonight. Only please, do not stay here. He finished writing and placed the paper against the mirror in the spot where she would be sure to see it. Beside it, he put a hundred mark note. And passing through the front hall, he heard again his wife singing in the bathroom. She had a gypsy kind of voice, a bewitching voice, happiness, a summer night, a guitar. She sang that night, seated on a cushion in the middle of the floor, and slid at her smiling eyes as she sang. He had just proposed to her. Yes, happiness, a summer night, a moth bumping against the ceiling. My soul, I surrender to you. I love you with an infinite passion. 
How dreadful. How dreadful, he kept repeating as he walked down the street. The night was very mild with a swarm of stars. It did not matter which way he went. By now she had probably come out of the bathroom and found the note. Anton Petrovich winced as he remembered the glove, a brand new glove afloat in a brimming pitcher. The vision of this brown, wretched thing caused him to utter a cry that made a passerby start. He saw the dark shapes of huge poplars around a square and thought, Mityushin lives here someplace. Anton Petrovich called him up from a bar, which arose before him as in a dream, and then receded into the distance like the tail light of a train. Mityushin let him in, but he was drunk, and at first paid no attention to Anton Petrovich's livid face. A person unknown to Anton Petrovich sat in the small dim room, and a black-haired lady in a red dress lay on the couch with her back to the table, apparently asleep. Bottles gleamed on the table. Anton Petrovich had arrived in the middle of a birthday celebration, but he never understood whether it was being held for Mikushin, the fair sleeper, or the unknown man who turned out to be a Russified German with the strange name of Gnushke. Mityushin, his rosy face beaming, introduced him to Gnushke and, indicating with a nod, the generous back of the sleeping lady, remarked casually, Adelaida Albertovna, I want you to meet a great friend of mine. The lady did not stir. Mityushin, however, did not show the least surprise, as if he had never expected her to wake up. All of this was a little bizarre and nightmarish. That empty vodka bottle with a rose stuck into its neck, that chessboard with a higgedly piggled game was in progress, the sleeping lady, the drunken but quite peaceful Gnushke. Have a drink, said Mityushin, and then suddenly raised his eyebrows. What's the matter with you, Anton Petrovich? You look very ill. Yes, by all means, have a drink. With idiotic earnestness, said Gnushke, a very long-faced man in a very tall collar who resembled a dachshund. Anton Petrovich gulped down half a cup of vodka and sat down. Now, tell us what happened, said Mityushin. Don't be embarrassed in front of Henry. He is the most honest man on earth. My move, Henry, and I warn you, if after this you grab my bishop, I'll mate you in three moves. Well, out with it, Anton Petrovich. We'll see about that in a minute, said Gnushke, revealing a big starched cuff as he stretched out his arm. You forgot about the pawn at h5. H5 yourself, said Mityushin. Anton Petrovich is going to tell us his story. Anton Petrovich had some more vodka, and the room went into a spin. The gliding chessboard seemed on the point of colliding with the bottles. The bottles, together with the table, set off towards the die couch. The couch with mysterious Adelaida Albertovna headed for the window, and the window also started to move. This accursed motion was somehow connected with Berg and had to be stopped. Stopped at once, trampled upon, torn, destroyed. I want you to be my second, began Anton Petrovich and was dimly aware that the phrase sounded oddly truncated, but could not correct that flaw. Second what? said Mityushin, absently glancing askance at the chessboard, over which Gnushke's hand hung, its fingers wriggling. No, you listen to me, Anton Petrovich exclaimed with anguish in his voice. You just listen. Let us not drink any more. This is serious, very serious. Mityushin fixed him with his shiny blue eyes. The game's cancelled, Henry, he said without looking at Nushke. This sounds serious. I intend to fight a duel, whispered Anton Petrovich, trying by mere optical force to hold back the table that kept floating away. I wish to kill a certain person. His name is Berg. You may have met him at my place. I prefer not to explain my reasons. You can explain everything to your second, said Mityushin smugly. Excuse me for interfering, said Gnushke suddenly, and raised his index finger. Remember, it has been said, thou shalt not kill. The man's name is Berg, said Anton Petrovich. 
I think you know him, and I need two seconds. The ambiguity could not be ignored. A duel, said Gnushki. Mityushin nudged him with his elbow. Don't interrupt, Henry. And that is all, Anton Petrovich concluded in a whisper, and lowering his eyes, feebly fingered the ribbon of his totally useless monocle. Silence. The lady on the couch snored comfortably. A car passed in the street, its horn blaring. I'm drunk, and Henry's drunk, muttered Mitushin. But apparently something very serious has happened. He chewed on his knuckles and looked at Gnushke. What do you think, Henry? Gnushke sighed. Tomorrow, you two will call on him, said Anton Petrovich. Select the spot, and so on. He did not leave me his card. According to the rules, he should have given me his card. I threw my glove at him. You are acting like a noble and courageous man, said Gnushke with growing animation. By a strange coincidence, I am not unfamiliar with these matters. A cousin of mine was also killed in a duel. Why also? Anton Petrovich wondered in anguish. Can this be a portent? Mityushin took a swallow from his cup and said jauntily, As a friend, I cannot refuse. We will go see Mr. Berg in the morning. As far as the German laws are concerned, said Gnushke, if you kill him, they'll put you in jail for several years. If, on the other hand, you are killed, they won't bother you. I have taken all that into consideration, Anton Petrovich said solemnly. Then there appeared again that beautiful, expensive implement, that shiny black pen with its delicate golden nib, which in normal times would glide like a wand of velvet across the paper. Now, however, Anton Petrovich's hand shook, and the table heaved like the deck of a storm-tossed ship. On a sheet of foolscap that Mityushin produced, Anton Petrovich wrote a cartel of defiance to Berg, three times calling him a scoundrel and concluding with the lame sentence, One of us must perish. Having done, he burst into tears, and Gnushke clucking his tongue wiped the poor fellow's face with a large red checkered handkerchief while Mitushin kept pointing at the chessboard repeating ponderously you'll finish him off like that king there mate in three moves and no questions asked anton petrovich sobbed and tried to brush away gnushka's friendly hands repeating with childish intonations i loved her so much so much and a new sad day was dawning. So at nine you will be at his house, said Anton Petrovich, lurching out of his chair. At nine we'll be at his house, Gnushki replied like an echo. We'll get in five hours of sleep, said Mityushin. Anton Petrovich smoothed his hat into shape. He had been sitting on it all the while, caught Mityushin's hand, held it for a moment, lifted it, and pressed it to his cheek. Come, come, you shouldn't, mumbled Mityushin and as before addressed the sleeping lady. Our friend is leaving, Adelaida Albertovna. This time she stirred, awakened with a start, and turned over heavily. Her face was full and creased by sleep, with slanting, excessively made-up eyes. You fellows better stop drinking, she said calmly, and turned back toward the wall. At the corner of the street, Anton Petrovich found a sleepy taxi, which whisked him with a ghostly speed through the wastes of the blue-gray city, and fell asleep again in front of his house. In the front hall, he met Elspeth, the maid who opened her mouth and looked at him with unkind eyes, as if about to say something. But she thought better of it, and shuffled off down the corridor in her carpet slippers. Wait, said Anton Petrovich. Is my wife gone? It's shameful, the maid said with great emphasis. This is a madhouse. Lug trunks in the middle of the night turn everything upside down. I asked if my wife was gone, Anton Petrovich shouted in a high-pitched voice. She is, glumly answered Elspeth. Anton Petrovich went on into the parlor. He decided to sleep there. The bedroom, of course, was out of the question. He turned on the light, lay down on the sofa, and covered himself with his overcoat. 
For some reason, his left wrist felt uncomfortable. Oh, of course, my watch. He took it off and wound it, thinking at the same time, Extraordinary. How this man retains his composure does not even forget to wind his watch. And since he was still drunk, enormous rhythmic waves immediately began rocking him up and down, up and down, and he began to feel very sick. He sat up, the big copper ash tray quick. His insides gave such a heave that a pain shot through his groin, and it all missed the ash tray. He fell asleep right away. One foot in its black shoe and gray spat dangled from the couch, and the light, which he had quite forgotten to turn off, lent a pale gloss to his sweaty forehead. Mitushin was a brawler and a drunkard. He could go and do all kinds of things at the least provocation. A real daredevil. One also recalls having heard about a certain friend of his who, to spite the post office, used to throw lighted matches into mailboxes, and he was nicknamed the Gnut. Quite possibly it was Gnushke. Actually, all Anton Petrovich had intended to do was spend the night at Metyushin's place. Then suddenly, for no reason at all, that talk about duels had started. Oh, of course, Berg must be killed. Only the matter ought to have been carefully thought out first, and if it had come to choosing seconds, they should in any case have been gentlemen. As it was, the whole thing had taken on an absurd, improper turn. Everything had been absurd and improper, beginning with the glove and ending with the ashtray. But now, of course, there was nothing to be done about it. He would have to drain this cup. He felt under the couch where his watch had landed. Eleven. Mityushin and Gnushke have already been at Berg's. Suddenly, a pleasant thought darted among the others, pushed them apart, and disappeared. What was it? Oh, of course. They had been drunk yesterday, and he had been drunk too. They must have overslept, then come to their senses and thought that he had been babbling nonsense. But the pleasant thought flashed past and vanished. It made no difference. The thing had been started, and he would have to repeat to them what he had said yesterday. Still, it was an odd thing that they had not shown up yet. A duel. What an impressive word. Duel. I'm having a duel. Hostile meeting. Single combat. Duel. Duel sounds best. He got up and noticed that his trousers were terribly wrinkled. The ashtray had been removed. Elspeth must have come in while he was sleeping. How embarrassing. Must go see how things look in the bedroom. Forget his wife. She did not exist anymore. Never had existed. All of that was gone. Anton Petrovich took a deep breath and opened the bedroom door. He found the maid there stuffing a crumpled newspaper into the wastebasket. Bring me some coffee, please, he said, and went to the dressing table. There was an envelope on it. His name, Tanya's hand. Beside it, in disorder, lay his hairbrush, his comb, his shaving brush, and an ugly stiff glove. Anton Petrovich opened the envelope, the hundred marks and nothing else. He turned it this way and that, not knowing what to do with it. Elspeth, the maid approached, glancing at him suspiciously. Here, take it. You were put to so much inconvenience last night, and then... Those un other unpleasant things go. Go on, take it. One hundred marks? The maid asked in a whisper, and then suddenly blushed crimson. Heaven only knows what rushed through her head, but she banged the wastebasket down on the floor and shouted, No! You can't bribe me! I'm an honest woman! Just you wait! I'll tell everybody you wanted to bribe me! No, this is a madhouse! And she went out slamming the door. What's wrong with her? Good Lord, what's wrong with her? muttered Anton Petrovich in confusion and stepping rapidly to the door, shrieked after the maid, Get out this minute! Get out of this house! That's the third person I've thrown out, he thought, his whole body trembling. And now there is no one to bring me my coffee. He spent a long time washing and changing and then sat in the cafe across the street, 
glancing every so often to see if Mityushin and Gnushke were not coming. He had lots of business to attend to in town, but he could not be bothered with business. Duel. A glamorous word. In the afternoon, Natasha, Tanya's sister, appeared. She was so upset that she could barely speak. Anton Petrovich paced back and forth, giving little pats to the furniture. Danya had arrived at her sister's flat in the middle of the night in a terrible state, a state you simply could not imagine. Anton Petrovich suddenly found it strange to be saying Uti to Natasha. After all, he was no longer married to her sister. I shall give her a certain sum every month under certain conditions, he said, trying to keep a rising hysterical note out of his voice. Money isn't the point, answered Natasha, sitting in the front of him and swinging her glossily stockinged leg. The point is that this is an absolutely awful mess. Thanks for coming, said Anton Petrovich. We'll have another chat sometime, only right now I'm very busy. As he saw her to the door, he remarked casually, or at least he hoped it sounded casual, I'm fighting a duel with him. Natasha's lips quivered, she quickly kissed him on the cheek and went out. How strange that she did not start imploring him not to fight. By all rights, she ought to have implored him not to fight. In our time, nobody fights duels. She is wearing the same perfume as... as who? No, no, he had never been married. A little later, still at about seven, Mityushin and Gnushke arrived. They looked grim. Gnushke bowed with reserve and handed Anton Petrovich a sealed business envelope. He opened it. It began, I have received your extremely stupid and extremely rude message. Anton Petrovich's monocle fell out. He reinserted it. I feel very sorry for you, but since you have adopted this attitude, I have no choice but to accept your challenge. Your seconds are pretty awful. Berg. Anton Petrovich's throat went unpleasantly dry, and there was again that ridiculous quaking in his legs. Sit down, sit down, he said, and himself sat down first. Gnushke sank back into an armchair, caught himself, and sat up on its edge. He is a highly insolent character, Mityushin said with feeling. Imagine he kept laughing all the while so that I nearly punched him in the teeth. Gnushke cleared his throat and said, There is only one thing I can advise you to do. Take careful aim, because he is also going to take careful aim. Before Anton Petrovich's eyes flashed a notebook page covered with X's, diagram of a cemetery. He is a dangerous fellow, said Gnushke, leaning back in his armchair, sinking again and again wriggling out. Who's going to make the report, Henry, you or I? asked Mityushin, chewing on a cigarette as he jerked at his lighter with his thumb. You'd better do it, said Gnushke. We've had a very busy day, said began Mityushin, goggling his baby blue eyes at Anton Petrovich. At exactly 8.30, Henry, who was still tight as a drum, and I... I protest, said Gnushke, went on to call on Mr. Berg. He was sipping his coffee. Right off, we handed him your little note, which he read, and what did he do, Henry? Yes, he burst out laughing. We waited for him to finish laughing, and Henry asked what his plans were. No, not his plans, but how he intended to react, Gnushke corrected. To react. To this, Mr. Berg replied that he agreed to fight, and that he chose pistols. We have set out all the conditions. The combatants will be placed facing each other at 12 paces. Firing will be regulated by a word of command. If nobody is dead after the first exchange, the duel may go on and on. What else was there, Henry? If it is impossible to procure real dueling pistols, then browning automatics will be used, said Gnushke. Browning automatics? Having established this much, we asked Mr. Berg how to get in touch with his seconds. He went out to telephone. Then he wrote the letter you have before you. Incidentally, he kept joking all the time. 
The next thing we did was to go to a cafe to meet his two chums. I bought Gnushke a carnation for his buttonhole. It was by this carnation that they recognized us. They introduced themselves, and, oh, well, to put it in a nutshell, everything is in order. Their names are uh, Marx and Engels. That's not quite exact, interjected Gnushke. They are Markov and Colonel Arhangelsky. No matter, said Mityushin, and went on. Here begins the epic part. Uh, we went out of town with these chaps to look for a suitable spot. You know, Weissdorf, just beyond one us? Uh, that's it. We took a walk through the woods there and found a glade where it turned out these chaps had a little picnic with their girls the other day. The glade is small, and all around there there is nothing but woods. In short, the ideal spot. Although, of course, you don't get the grand mountain decor as in Lermontov's fatal affair. Uh, see the state of my boots? All white with dust. Mine too, said Gnushke. I must say, the, the trip was quite a strenuous one. There followed a pause. It is hot today, said Mityushin, even hotter than yesterday. Considerably hotter, said Gnushke. With exaggerated thoroughness, Mityushin began crushing his cigarette in the ashtray. Silence. Anton Petrovich's heart was beating in his throat. He tried to swallow it, but it started pounding even harder. When would the duel take place? Tomorrow? Why didn't they tell him? Maybe the day after tomorrow? It would be better the day after tomorrow. Mityushin and Gnushke exchanged glances and got up. We shall call for you tomorrow at 6.30 a.m., said Mityushin. There is no point in leaving sooner. There is a damn soul out there anyway. Anton Petrovich got up too. What should he do? Thank them? Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. Everything is settled then. All right then. The others bowed. We must still find a doctor and the pistols, said Gnushke. In the front hall, Anton Petrovich took Mityushin by the elbow and mumbled, You know, it's awfully silly, but you see, I don't know how to shoot, so to speak. I mean, I know how, but I have no practice at all. Hmm, said Mityushin. That's two men. Today is Sunday, otherwise you could have taken a lesson or two. That's really bad luck. Colonel Arkhangelsky gives private shooting lessons, put in Gnushke. Yes, said Mityushin, you're the smart one, aren't you? Still, what are we to do, Anton Petrovich? You know what? Beginners are lucky. Put your trust in God and just press the trigger. They left. Dusk was falling. Nobody had lowered the blinds. There must be some cheese and graham crackers in the sideboard. The rooms were deserted and motionless, as if all the furniture had once breathed and moved about, but had now died. A ferocious cardboard dentist bending over a panic-streaking patient of cardboard. This he had seen such a short time ago, on a blue-green, violet, ruby night, shot with fireworks at the Luna Park. Berg took a long time, aiming... The air rifle popped, the pellet hit the target, releasing a spring, and the cardboard dentist yanked out a huge tooth with a quadruple root. Tanya clapped her hands, and Don Petrovich smiled. Berg fired again, and the cardboard discs rattled as they spun. The clay pipes were shattered one after another, and the ping-pong ball dancing on a slender jet of water disappeared. How awful... And most awful of all, Tanya had then said jokingly, It wouldn't be much fun fighting a duel with you. Twenty paces. Anton Petrovich went from door to window, counting the paces. Eleven. He inserted his monocle and tried to estimate the distance. Two such rooms. Oh, if only he could manage to disable Berg at the first fire. But he did not know how to aim the thing. He was bound to miss. Here, this letter opener, for example. No, better take this paperweight. You are supposed to hold it like this and take aim. Or like this, perhaps right up near your chin. It seems easier to do it this way. And at this instant, as he held before him the paperweight in the form of a parrot, pointing it this way and that, Anton Petrovich realized that he would be killed. 
At about 10, he decided to go to bed. The bedroom, though, was taboo. With great effort, he found some clean bedclothes in the dresser, recased the pillow, and spread a sheet over the leather couch in the parlor. As he undressed, he thought, I am going to bed for the last time in my life. Nonsense, faintly squeaked some little part of Anton Petrovich's soul, the same particle that had made him throw the slam the door and call Berg a scoundrel. Nonsense, Anton Petrovich said in a thin voice, and at once told himself that it was not right to say such things. If I think that nothing will happen to me, then the worst will happen. Everything in life always happens the other way around. It would be nice to read something for the last time before going to sleep. There I go again, he moaned inwardly. Why for the last time? I am in a terrible state. I must take hold of myself. Oh, if only I were given some sign. Cards! He found a deck of cards on a nearby console and took the top card. A three of diamonds. What does the three of diamonds mean? Chiromantically. No idea. Then he drew in that order the queen of diamonds, the eight of clubs, the ace of spades. Ah, that's too bad. The ace of spades, I think that means death? But then that's a lot of nonsense. Superstitious nonsense. Midnight. Five past. Tomorrow has become today. I have a duel today. He sought peace in vain. Strange things kept happening. The book he was holding, a novel by some German writer or other that was called The Magic Mountain, and mountain in German is Berg. He decided that if he counted to three and a streetcar went by at three, he would be killed, and a streetcar obliged. And then Anton Petrovich did the very worst thing a man in his situation could have done. He decided to reason out what death really meant. When he had thought along these lines for a minute or so, everything lost sense. He found it difficult to breathe. He got up, walked about the room, and took a look out the window at the pure and terrible night sky. Must write my testament, thought Anton Petrovich. But to make a will was, so to speak, playing with fire. It meant inspecting the contents of one's own urn in the columbarium. Best thing is to get some sleep, he said aloud. But as soon as he closed his eyelids, Berg's grinning face would appear before him, purposely slitting one eye. He would turn on the light again, attempt to read, smoke, though he was not a regular smoker. Trivial memories floated by. A toy pistol, a path in the park, that sort of thing, and he would immediately cut short his recollections with the thought that those who are about to die always remember trifles from their past. Then the opposite thing frightened him. He realized that he was not thinking of Tanya, that he was numbed by a strange drug that made him insensitive to her absence. She was my life, and she has gone, he thought. I have already, unconsciously, bid life farewell, and everything is now indifferent to me, since I shall be killed. The night, meanwhile, was beginning to wane. At about four, he shuffled into the dining room and drank a glass of soda water. A mirror near which he passed reflected his striped pajamas and thinning, wispy hair. I am going to look like my own ghost, he thought, but how can I get some sleep? How? He wrapped himself in a lap rope, for he noticed that his teeth were chattering, and he sat down in an armchair in the middle of the dim room that was slowly asserting itself. How will it all be? I must dress somberly but elegantly. Tuxedo? No, that would be idiotic. A black suit, then, and yes, a black tie. The new black suit. But if there's a wound, a shoulder wound, say... The suit will be ruined, the blood, the hole, and besides, they may start cutting off the sleeve. Nonsense, nothing of the sort is going to happen. I must wear my new black suit, and when the duel starts, I shall turn up my jacket collar. That's the custom, I think, in order to conceal the whiteness of one's shirt. 
probably, or simply because of the morning damp. That's how they did it in that film I saw. Then, I must keep absolutely cool, and address everyone politely and calmly. Thank you, I have already fired. It is your turn now. If you do not remove that cigarette from your mouth, I shall not fire. I am ready to continue. Thank you, I have already laughed. That's what you say to a stale joke. Oh, if one could only imagine all the details, they would arrive. He, Mityushin, and Gnushke in a car, leave the car on the road, walk into the woods. Berg and his second would probably be waiting there already. They always do in books. Now, there was a question, does one salute one's opponent? What does Anyegin do in the opera? Perhaps a discreet tip of the hat from a distance would do just right. Then, they would probably start marking off the yards and loading the pistols. What would he do meanwhile? Yes, of course, he would place one foot on a stump somewhere, a little way off, and wait in that casual attitude. But what if Berg also put one foot on a stump? Berg was capable of it, mimicking me to embarrass me. That would be awful. Other possibilities would be to lean against a tree trunk or simply sit down on the grass. Somebody in a Pushkin story ate cherries from a paper bag. Yes, but you would have to bring that bag to the dueling ground. Looks silly. Oh well, he would decide when the time came dignified and nonchalant. Then we would take our positions, twenty yards between us. It would be then that he should turn up his collar. He would grasp the pistol like this. Colonel Arkhangelsky would wave a handkerchief or count till three. And then, suddenly, something utterly terrible, something absurd would happen. An unimaginable thing. Even if one thought about it for nights on end, even if one lived to be a hundred in Turkey, Nice, uh, to travel, in cafes, what does one feel when a bullet hits one between the ribs or in the forehead? Pain? Nausea? Or is there simply a bang followed by total darkness? The tenor Sobinov once crashed down so realistically that his pistol flew into the orchestra. And what if instead he received a ghastly wound of some kind, in one eye or in the groin? No, Berg would kill him outright. Of course, here I've counted only the ones I've killed outright. One more cross in that little black book. Unimaginable. The dining room clock struck five. Ding dong. With a tremendous effort, shivering and clutching at the lap robe, Anton Petrovich got up, then paused again, lost in thought, and suddenly stamped his foot. Like Louis Sixteenth stamped his when told it was time, Your Majesty, to go to the scaffold. Nothing to be done about it. Stamped his soft, clumsy foot. The execution was inevitable. Time to shave, wash, and dress. Scrupulously clean underwear and the new black suit. As he inserted the opal links into his shirt cuffs, Anton Petrovich mused that opals were the stones of fate, and that it was only two or three hours before the shirt would be all bloody. Where would the hole be? He stroked the shiny hairs that went down his fat, warm chest, and felt so frightened that he covered his eyes with his hand. There was something pathetically independent about the way everything within him was moving now. The heart pulsating, the lungs swelling, the blood circulating, the intestines contracting, and he was leading to slaughter this tender, defenseless inner creature that lived so blindly, so trustingly, slaughter. He grabbed his favorite shirt, undid one button and grunted as he plunged headfirst into the cold white darkness of the linen enveloping him. Socks, tie, he awkwardly shined his shoes with a chamois rag. As he searched for a clean handkerchief, he stumbled on a stick of rouge. He glanced into the mirror at his hideously pale face 
and then tentatively touched his cheek with the crimson stuff. At first, it made him look even worse than before. He licked his finger and rubbed his cheek, regretting that he had never taken a close look at how women apply makeup. A light brick hue was finally imparted to his cheeks, and he decided it looked all right. There, I'm ready now, he said, addressing the mirror, and then came an agonizing yawn, and the mirror dissolved into tears. He rapidly scented his handkerchief, distributed papers, handkerchief, keys, and fountain pen in various pockets, and slipped into the black noose of his monocle. Pity I don't have a good pair of gloves. The pair I had was nice and new, but the left glove is widowed. The drawback inherent in duels. He sat down at his writing desk, placed his elbows on it, and began waiting, glancing now out of the window, now at the traveling clock in its folding leather case. It was a beautiful morning. The sparrows twittered like mad in the tall linen tree under the window. A pale blue velvet shadow covered the street, and here and there a roof would flash silver. Anton Petrovich was cold and had an unbearable headache. A nip of brandy would be paradise. None in the house. House already deserted. Master going away forever. Oh, nonsense. We insist on calmness. The front door bell will ring in a moment. I must keep perfectly calm. The bell is going to ring right now. They are already three minutes late. Maybe they won't come? Such a marvelous summer morning. Who was the last person killed in a duel in Russia? A Baron Teufel, twenty years ago. No, they won't come. Good. He would wait another half hour and then go to bed. The bedroom was losing its horror and becoming definitely attractive. Anton Petrovich opened his mouth wide, preparing to squeeze out a huge lump of yawn. He felt the crunch in his ears, the swelling under his palate, and it was then that the doorbell brutally rang. Spasmodically swallowing the unfinished yawn, Anton Petrovich went into the front hall, unlocked the door, and Mityushin and Gnushke ushered each other across the threshold. Time to go, said Mityushin, gazing intently at Anton Petrovich. He was wearing his usual pistachio-colored tie, but Gnushke had put on an old frock coat. Yes, uh, I am ready, said Anton Petrovich. I'll be right with you. He left them standing in the front hall, rushed into the bedroom, and in order to gain time started washing his hands while he kept repeating to himself, What is happening? My God, what is happening? Just five minutes ago there had still been hope. There might have been an earthquake. Berg might have died of a heart attack. Fate might have intervened. Suspended events. Saved him. Anton Petrovich, hurry up, called Mityushin from the front hall. Quickly, he dried his hands and joined the others. Yes, yes, I'm ready. Let's go. We'll have to take the train, said Mityushin when they were outside, because if we arrive by taxi in the middle of the forest and at this hour, it might seem suspicious and the driver might tell the police. Anton Petrovich, please, don't start losing your nerve. I'm not, and don't be silly, replied Anton Petrovich with a helpless smile. Gnushke, who had remained silent until this point, loudly blew his nose and said matter-of-factly, Our adversary is bringing the doctor. We were unable to find dueling pistols. However, our colleagues did produce two identical Brownings. In the taxi that was to take them to the station, they seated themselves thus. Anton Petrovich and Mityushin in the back and Gnushke facing them on the jump seat, with his legs pulled in. Anton Petrovich was again overcome by a nervous fit of yawning, that revengeful yawn he had suppressed. Again and again came that humpy spasm so that his eyes watered. Mityushin and Gnushke looked very solemn, but at the same time seemed exceedingly pleased with themselves. Anton Petrovich clenched his teeth and yawned with his nostrils only. Then abruptly he said, I had an excellent night's sleep. He tried to think of something else to say. Quite a few people in the streets, he said and added, in spite of the early hour. 
Mitushin and Gnushke were silent. Another fit of yawning. Oh, God. They soon arrived at the station. It seemed to Anton Petrovich that he had never traveled so fast. Gnushke brought the tickets and, holding them fanwise, went ahead. Suddenly, he looked around at Mitushin and cleared his throat significantly. By the refreshment booth stood Berg. He was getting some change out of his trouser pocket, thrusting his left hand deep inside it and holding the pocket in place with his right, the way Anglo-Saxons do in cartoons. He produced a coin in the palm of his hand, and as he handed it to the woman vendor, said something that made her laugh. Berg laughed too. He stood with legs slightly spread. He was wearing a gray flannel suit. Let's go around that booth, said Mityushin. It would be awkward passing right next to him. A strange numbness came over Anton Petrovich. Totally unconscious of what he was doing, he boarded the coach, took a window seat, removed his hat, donned it again. Only when the train jerked and began to move did his brain start working again, and in this instant he was possessed by the feeling that comes in dreams when, speeding along in a train, from nowhere to nowhere, you suddenly realize that you are traveling clad only in your underpants. They are in the next coach, said Mitushin, taking out a cigarette case. Why on earth do you keep yawning all the time, Anton Petrovich? It gives one the creeps. I always do in the morning, mechanically answered Anton Petrovich. Pine trees, pine trees, pine trees. A sandy slope, more pine trees, such a marvelous morning. That frock coat, Henry, is not a success, said Mitushin. No questions about it. To put it bluntly, it just isn't. That's my business, said Gnoshke. Lovely, those pines. And now a gleam of water. Woods again, how touching the world, how fragile. If I could only keep from yawning again, jaws aching. If you restrain the yawn, your eyes begin watering. He was sitting with his face turned towards the window, listening to the wheels beating out the rhythm. Abattoir, abattoir, abattoir. Here's what I can advise you to do, said Gnushke. Blaze at once. I advise you to aim at the center of his body. You have more of a chance that way. It's all a question of luck, said Mitushin. If you hit him, fine, and if not, don't worry, he might miss too. A duel becomes real only after the first exchange. It is then that the interesting part begins, so to speak. A station <laughs> did not stop long. Why did they torture him so? To die today would be unthinkable. What if I faint? You have to be a good actor. What can I try? What shall I do? Such a marvelous morning. Anton Petrovich, excuse me for asking, said Mityushin, but it's important. You don't have anything to entrust to us? I mean, papers, documents, a letter maybe, or a will? It's the usual procedure. Anton Petrovich shook his head. Penny, said Mityushin, never know what might happen. Take Henry and I. We're all set for a sojourn in jail. Are your affairs in order? Anton Petrovich nodded. He was no longer able to speak. The only way to keep from screaming was to watch the pines that kept flashing past. We'll get off in a minute, said Gnushke and rose. Mitushin rose also. Clenching his teeth, Anton Petrovich wanted to rise too, but a jolt of the train made him fall back into his seat. Here we are, said Mitushin. Only then did Anton Petrovich manage to separate himself from the seat. Pressing his monocle into his eye socket, he cautiously descended to the platform. The sun welcomed him warmly. They are behind, said Gnushke. Anton Petrovich felt his back growing a hump. No, this is unthinkable. I must wake up. They left the station and set out along the highway, past tiny brick houses with petunias in the windows. There was a tavern at the intersection of the highway and of a soft white road leading off into the forest. Suddenly Anton Petrovich stopped. I'm awfully thirsty, he muttered. I could do with a drop of something. Yes, that wouldn't hurt, said Mityushin. Gnushke looked back and said, They have left the road and turned into the woods. It will only be a minute, said Mityushin. The three of them entered the tavern. 
A fat woman was wiping the counter with a rag. She scowled at them and poured three mugs of beer. Anton Petrovich swallowed, choked slightly, and said, Excuse me for a second. Hurry, said Mitushin, putting his mug back on the bar. Anton Petrovich turned into the passage, followed the arrow to men. Mankind, human beings, marched past the toilet, past the kitchen, gave a start when a cat darted under his feet, quickened his step, reached the end of the passage, pushed open a door, and a shower of sunlight splashed his face. He found himself in a little green yard, where hens walked about and a boy in a faded bathing suit sat on a log. Anton Petrovich rushed past him, past some elder bushes, down a couple of wooden steps and into more bushes, then suddenly slipped, for the ground sloped. Branches whipped against his face, and he pushed them aside awkwardly, diving and slipping, the slope overgrown with elder kept growing steeper. At last, his headlong descent became uncontrollable. He slid down on tense, outspread legs, warning off the springy twigs. Then he embraced an unexpected tree at full speed and began moving obliquely. The bushes thinned out. Ahead was a tall fence. He saw a loophole in it, rustled through the nettles, and found himself in a pine grove where shadowed, dappled laundry hung between the tree trunks near a shack. With the same purposefulness, he traversed the ground and presently realized that he was again sliding downhill. Ahead of him, water simmered among the trees. He stumbled, then saw a path to his right. It led him to the lake. An old fisherman, sun-tanned, the color of smoked flounder, and wearing a straw hat, indicated the way to the Wansea Station. The road at first skirted the lake, then turned into the forest, and he wandered through the woods for about two hours before emerging at the railroad tracks. He trudged to the nearest station, and as he reached it, a train approached. He boarded a car and squeezed in between two passengers, who glanced with curiosity at this fat, pale, moist man in black, with painted cheeks and dirty shoes, a monocle in his begrimed eye socket. Only upon reaching Berlin did he pause for a moment, or at least he had the sensation that up to this moment he had been fleeing continuously, and only now had stopped to catch his breath and look around him. He was in a familiar square. Beside him, an old woman with an enormous woolen bosom was selling carnations. A man in an armor-like coating of newspapers was touting the title of a local scandal sheet. A shoeshine man gave Anton Petrovich a fawning look. Anton Petrovich sighed with relief and placed his foot firmly on the stand, whereupon the man's elbows began working lickety-split. It is all horrible, of course, he thought as he watched the tip of his shoe begin to gleam. But I am alive, and for a moment that is the main thing. Mityushin and Gnushke had probably traveled back to town and were standing guard before his house, so he would have to wait a while for things to blow over. In no circumstances must he meet them. Much later, he would go to fetch his things, and he must leave Berlin that very day. Dobry day, Anton Petrovich, came a gentle voice right above his ear. He gave such a start that his foot slipped off the stand. No, it was all right, false alarm. The voice behind belonged to a certain Leontiev, a man he had met three or four times, a journalist or something of the sort, a talkative but harmless fellow. They said his wife deceived him left and right. Out for a stroll? asked Leontiev, giving him a melancholy handshake. Yes, uh, no, I have very things to do, replied Anton Petrovich, thinking at the same time. I hope he proceeds on his way, otherwise it will be quite dreadful. Leontiev looked around and said as though he had made a happy discovery. Splendid weather. Actually, he was a pessimist, and like all pessimists, a ridiculously unobservant man. His face was ill-shaven, yellowish, and long, and all of him looked clumsy, emaciated, and lugubrious as if nature had suffered from toothache when creating him. The shoeshine man jauntily clapped his brushes together. Anton Petrovich looked at his revived shoes. Which way are you headed? asked Leontiev. And you? asked Anton Petrovich. Makes no difference to me. I'm free right now. I can keep you company for a while. He cleared his throat and added insinuatingly. I if you allow me, of course. Of course, please do, mumbled Anton Petrovich. Now he's attached himself, he thought must find some less familiar street or else more acquaintances will turn up. If I can only avoid meeting these two. Well, how is life treating you? 
asked Luontiev. He belonged to the breed of people who ask how life is treating you only to give a delighted account of how it is treating them. Oh, well, I, I'm all right, Anton Petrovich replied. Uh, of course, he'll toot out about all it afterwards. Good lord, what a mess. I'm going this way, he said aloud and turned sharply. Smiling sadly at his own thoughts, Leontiev almost ran into him and swayed slightly on his lanky legs. This way? All right, it's all the same to me. What shall I do, thought Anton Petrovich. After all, I can't just keep strolling with him like this. I have to think things over and decide so much, and I'm awfully tired and my corns hurt. As for Leontiev, he had already launched into a long story. He spoke in a level, unhurried voice. He spoke of how much he paid for his room, how hard it was to pay, how hard life was for him and his wife, how rarely one got a good landlady, how insolent theirs was with his wife. Adelaida Albertovna, of course, has a quick temper herself, he uttered with a sigh. Uh, he was one of those middle-class Russians who use the patronymic when speaking of their spouses. They were walking along an anonymous street where the pavement was being repaired. One of the workmen had a dragon tattooed on his bare chest. Anton Petrovich wiped his forehead with his handkerchief and said, I have some business near here. They are waiting for me. Uh, a business appointment. Oh, I'll walk you there, said Leontiev sadly. Anton Petrovich surveyed the street. A sign said hotel. A squalid and squat little hotel between a scaffolded building and a warehouse. I have to go in there, said Anton Petrovich. Yes, th this hotel, a business appointment. Leontiev took off his torn glove and gave him a soft handshake. No, what? I, I think I'll wait a while for you. Won't be long, will you? Quite long, I'm afraid, said Anton Petrovich. Pity. You see... I wanted to talk something over with you and ask your advice. Well, no matter. I'll wait around for a while, just in case. Maybe you'll get through early. Anton Petrovich went into the hotel. He had no choice. It was empty and darkish inside. A disheveled person materialized from behind a desk and asked what he wanted. A room, answer Anton Petrovich answered softly. The man pondered this, scratched his head, and demanded a deposit. Anton Petrovich handed over ten marks. A red-haired maid, rapidly wiggling her behind, led him down a long corridor and unlocked the door. He entered, heaved a deep sigh, and sat down in a low armchair of ribbed velvet. He was alone. The furniture, the bed, the washstand seemed to awake, to give him a frowning look, and go back to sleep. In this drowsy, totally unremarkable hotel room, Anton Petrovich was at last alone. Hunching over, covering his eyes with his hand, he lapsed into thought, and before him, bright speckled images passed by. Patches of sunny greenery, a boy on a log, a fisherman, Leontiev, Berg, Tanya. And at the thought of Tanya, he moaned and hunched over even more tensely. Her voice, her dear voice... So light, so girlish, quick of eye and limb, she would perch on the sofa, tuck her legs under her, and her skirt would float up around her like a silk dome, and then drop back. Or else she would sit at the table, quite motionless, only blinking now and then, and blowing out cigarette smoke with her face upturned. It's senseless. Why did you cheat? For you did cheat. What shall I do without you? Tanya, don't you see you cheated, my darling? Why? Why? Emitting little moans and cracking his finger joints, he began pacing up and down the room, bumping against the furniture without noticing it. He happened to stop by the window and glance out into the street. At first he could not see the street because of the mist in his eyes, but presently the street appeared with a truck at the curb, a bicyclist, an old lady gingerly stepping off the sidewalk, and along the sidewalk slowly strode Leontiev, reading a newspaper as he went. He passed and turned the corner. And for some reason, at the sight of Leontiev, Anton Petrovich realized just how hopeless his situation was. Yes, hopeless, for there was no other word for it. 
Only yesterday he had been a perfectly honorable man, respected by friends, acquaintances, and fellow workers at the bank. His job. There was not even a, any question of it. Everything was different now. He had run down a slippery slope. And now he was at the bottom. But how can it be? I must decide something, Anton Petrovich said in a thin voice. Perhaps there was a way out. They had tormented him for a while, but enough was enough. Yes, he had to decide. He remembered the suspicious gaze of the man at the front desk. What should one say to that person? Oh, obviously, I'm going to fetch my luggage. I left it at the station. So, goodbye, forever, little hotel. The street. Thank God was now clear. Leontief had finally given up and left. How do I get to the nearest streetcar stop? Oh, just go straight, my dear sir, and you will reach the nearest streetcar stop. No, better take the taxi. Off we go. The streets grow familiar again. Calmly, quite calmly, tipped the taxi driver. Home. Five floors. Calmly, quite calmly, he went into the front hall, then quickly opened the parlor door. My, what a surprise. In the parlor about the circular table sat Mityushin, Gnushke, and Tanya. On the table stood bottles, glasses, and cups. Mityushin beamed, pink-faced, shiny-eyed, drunk as an owl. Gnushke was drunk, too, and also beamed, rubbing his hands together. Tanya was sitting with her bare elbows on the table, gazing at him motionlessly. At last! exclaimed Mityushin and took him by the arm. At last you've shown up! He added in a whisper with a mischievous wink, you sly boots, you! Anton Petrovich now sits down and has some vodka. Mityushin and Gnushke keep giving him the same mischievous but good-natured looks. Tanya says, you must be hungry, I'll get you a sandwich. Yes, a big ham sandwich with the edge of fat overlapping. She goes to make it and then Mityushin and Gnushke rush to him and begin to talk, interrupting each other. You lucky fellow, just imagine, Mr. Berg also lost his nerve. Well, not also, but lost his nerve anyhow. While we were waiting for you at the tavern, his seconds came in and announced that Berg had changed his mind. Those broad-shouldered bullies always turned out to be cowards. Gentlemen, we ask you to excuse us for having agreed to act as seconds for this scoundrel. That's how lucky you are, Anton Petrovich. So everything is now just dandy, and you came out of it honorably while he's disgraced forever. And most important, your wife, when she heard about it, immediately left Berg and returned to you, and you must forgive her. Anton Petrovich smiled broadly, got up, and started fiddling with the ribbon of his monocle. His smile slowly faded away. Such things don't happen in real life. He looked at the moth-eaten plush, the plump bed, the washstand, and this wretched room in this wretched hotel seemed to him to be the room in which he would have to live from that day on. He sat down on the bed, took off his shoes, wiggled his toes with relief, and noticed that there was a blister on his heel and a corresponding hole in his sock. Then he rang the bell and ordered a ham sandwich. When the maid placed the plate on the table, he deliberately looked away. But as soon as the door had shut, he grabbed the sandwich with both hands, immediately soiled his fingers and chin with the hanging margin of fat, and grunting greedily, began to munch.